Hi, I'm Richard Sedlock. Welcome to the Green Ninja course on climate science. This is episode four in which we'll investigate systems and feedbacks. These two concepts are fundamental for understanding how Earth's climate operates. Scientists refer to Earth's climate as a complex system. What's a system? Many definitions exist, but my preference is something like the following. A set of interrelated components. Or you can expand that slightly to a set of components and the relationships among those components. For example, a high school basketball team consists of components such as players, coaches, and trainers, and of the relationships among those people. The teacher-student relationship between the coaches and the players, the medical professional patient relationship between the trainers and uh, the trainers and the players, and the presumably cooperative relationship among the players. You can probably think of bazillions of examples that fit this definition of a system, which is completely appropriate because our world hosts bazillions of systems. But what makes a system complex? In a complex system many of the individual components are themselves systems. And these are often referred to as subsystems. For example, the atmosphere is a complex system in its own right. It's a part of the global climate system. Another example, my home department of geology is a system that is part of the complex system known as San Jose State University, which itself is one of 23 campuses in the California State University system. And a final example, your finger joints are parts of your hands, which are complex systems themselves. And, and they're part of your physical body, which is an even more complex system. This concept map of Earth's climate system was developed with students in one of my courses. It's incomplete, and I've been meaning to update it for several years now, but even in this draft form, it gives you some idea of the stunning degree of interconnectedness among the components of Earth's climate system. We're talking about one of the most complex systems humans have ever tried to envision. Little wonder that it's so hard to pin it down. Still, the insights that climatologists have attained are impressive given this level of complexity. Most climate systems are, sorry, most complex systems are nonlinear. In a nonlinear system, a particular problem or question, like some aspect of climate, can't be solved by simply adding the effects of independent components. That's because the components aren't independent. They can't be isolated because they're so interdependent with other components. This is certainly the case for Earth's climate system, as we saw on the preceding slide, but also for many other complex systems in modern life. An example is the slow motion global financial collapse that's been underway since 2012. You can't understand it fully by examining the finances of a single country or bank because so many countries and banks have financial relationships with one another. Equilibrium and stability are familiar words that have many meanings, including meanings that apply specifically to systems. These terms help us understand climate and other Earth systems. A system that doesn't change is at equilibrium. An equilibrium, in other words, a system at equilibrium, can be stable or unstable. Consider these two sketches. If you somehow manage to perfectly balance a pencil on its sharpened point, you render it motionless, and thus it's at equilibrium. If you hang a picture from a nail on the wall, it too is motionless and thus it's also at equilibrium. But you know the picture is much more likely than the pencil to maintain its position. The hanging picture is termed a stable system. The balanced pencil is an unstable one. A system is stable if its components return to or towards their original state following a small disturbance. Jiggle the picture a little bit and it will oscillate for a while before returning to its original position. A system is unstable if its components continue to move away from its original state following, or their original states, following a small disturbance. If you lightly breathe on the pencil, that's all she wrote, so to speak. Also of interest is the term metastable. 
a metastable state survives smaller disturbances, but not larger ones. We all experience metastability in our lives, in aspects like finances and relationships and health and all kinds of others. Now, this may seem like a non sequitur, but trust me, it isn't. Con consider Earth's surface temperature over its long history. The present is on the left. Earth's formation 4.6 billion years ago is on the right. And note that the horizontal timescale isn't linear. The diagram shows past temperatures relative to modern ones. Warmer than modern periods are shown in hotter colors. And the thick black line lies above the thin horizontal line in those times. Cooler periods are shown in blue. And the thick black line lies below the thin horizontal line. By the way, the thick black line shows more wiggles in the recent geologic past because geologists have more access, more refined estimates because there's more geologic data of that age. The average surface temperature certainly has varied over the course of Earth history, but the variations have stayed within a certain range without extreme highs or lows. Does Earth's temperature history reflect a system at equilibrium? Does it reflect a stable system? What do you think? Pause me for, for however long it takes to make a decision about these two questions. Does Earth's temperature history show a system at equilibrium? Does it show a stable system? Well, Earth's temperature has changed repeatedly over its history, so it hasn't attained equilibrium. However, the temperature hasn't changed much, or at least it stays to seems to vary within a, a confined range, so it has been stable. Let's consider some more examples. Here are several sketches of a ball on a curved surface. In the top left sketch, the ball is not at equilibrium. In the next instant of time, it'll roll downhill to the left. However, in all four of the other sketches, the ball is at rest. So each of these systems is at equilibrium, barring any outside disturbance, and of course, outside disturbance is what humans are all about. So we add arrows to show the directions the ball could move when the system is disturbed. Just imagine shaking the system from side to side. For each of the numbered sketches, decide whether the system is stable, unstable, or metastable. Let's start with number one. So I'm going to pause slightly for you to, for you to decide whether it's stable, unstable, or metastable. So yes, this is a stable configuration. That ball might rattle around after you shake it side to side, but it'll settle back into its original position soon after the disturbance ends. How about sketch number two? Well, this obviously is an unstable configuration. It's nearly as precarious as the balanced pencil in our earlier example. Any slight disturbance will move the ball off the hill and it won't return. How about sketch number three? Think, find this one a bit tricky. It's actually a metastable system. The ball will stay in its valley as long as the disturbance isn't too great, but if the shaking is strong enough, it'll hop out of that valley to the right and won't return. So overall, this system is unstable. And sketch number four. This sketch also depicts a metastable situation, but overall, the system is stable. The ball will end up in one of the two side valleys. We've talked about systems, now I want to address feedback. In the world of science and systems theory, the term feedback has much more specific meanings than in common usage, where depending on the person and the circumstances, it may be used to mean constructive criticism or opportunity to insult a colleague whom I secretly despise or useless opinion that I don't really care about and will completely ignore, but I digress. System feedbacks can be negative or positive. Neither term involves a value judgment. Negative feedbacks return components of a system towards their original states after a small disturbance. So they act as stabilizers for the system. And stability is most likely when the negative feedback acts rapidly and gently. In contrast, positive feedbacks add to or amplify the original disturbance. Depending on circumstances, a positive feedback could be construed as good or bad, 
And the same holds true for a negative feedback. But good and bad are not implied by the words positive and negative. Based on my teaching experience, this is by far the greatest source of misunderstanding of all the systems concepts. Let's consider some examples. Does the temperature in a classroom involve a positive or negative feedback? Let's say the thermostat in a classroom is set at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And the room is at exactly that temperature. And then 40 students come in. And they spend the next hour respiring and perspiring. What happens to the temperature in the room? Well, it starts to rise, of course, due to the cumulative heat generated by all those human bodies. As a result, the thermostat recruits the air conditioner, which kicks on and starts to lower the temperature back towards 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Alternatively, someone might walk into the empty 70 degree classroom and open the windows on an icy winter day. The temperature in the room drops, so the thermostat recruits the furnace which kicks on and starts to raise the temperature back towards 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this combination of a thermostat furnace and air conditioning in this classroom provides us with an example of a negative feedback. In each case, the system worked to offset or counter the change to return the system to its starting point. What about the number of humans on Earth? Well, humans make babies. More humans means more babies and their babies grow up to make progressively more babies, and before long, the planet is seething with humans. So long as the birth rate exceeds the death rate, which has been the case for almost all of human history, humanity provides us with an example of a positive feedback. What about the number of deer in Arkansas? Well, if more deer breed more deer, you'd think another positive feedback should develop, right? However, more deer are a nuisance for most Arkansas homeowners and provide meat for Arkansas hunters. So humans would kill off a bunch of the increasing number of deer, cutting back on their numbers. So this is a negative feedback because it counters the original increase in the number of deer. Climate forcings are perturbations that produce negative or positive feedbacks throughout the climate system. Because feedbacks are so critical for projecting future climate change, we're going to consider several examples and we'll use a sort of flow chart form. We start with the feedback between ice and albedo. Albedo is the reflectivity of a surface. Uh, more reflective lighter colors have a higher albedo than darker colors. Well, let's say some disturbance or perturbation causes the Earth's surface to cool. Perhaps solar radiation is reduced temporarily, or Earth's orbit changes slightly. It doesn't matter. The cause is irrelevant. The Earth's surface cools. What happens next? Well, because the surface is cooler, ice and snow don't melt as readily. And so more of the Earth's surface is covered for more of the year by ice and snow. Ice and snow are white. The additional white stuff increases Earth's albedo, or reflectivity. As a result, Less solar radiation is absorbed, more of it's reflected back into space. As a result, Earth cools even more. Now this simple example illustrates a feedback loop. Is the loop positive or negative? It's positive. The result is further change in the direction of the original disturbance. So in this case, cooling of the Earth results in additional cooling of the Earth. Here's another one. You're going to do this. Let's, let's say an initial perturbation warms the Earth. Which of the six trios of terms listed below will correctly complete the loop, starting in the lower left and ending in the upper right? So pause me, and don't restart the presentation until you've decided on which of A through F is the right trio to fill in those blanks. The correct answer is C. Ice and snow coverage would decrease because of the higher temperature, which would decrease Earth's albedo, which would increase the absorption of sunlight. Like the previous example, this is a positive feedback. But in this case, the Earth becomes warmer because that was the nature of the original perturbation. Here's another example. It's more complicated than the earlier ones, and even still it greatly simplifies the complexity of the actual climate system in this case specifically involving clouds. Say that some initial forcing increases Earth's air temperature. Well, this warming will increase evaporation 
and thus increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Well, this will increase the amount of cloud coverage because clouds are visible manifestations of water vapor. What happens next? Let's consider cloud coverage's impact on two other aspects of the climate system. First, we'll look at Earth's albedo. Remember, albedo is the reflectivity of the surface. Second, we'll consider the heat, or technically the infrared radiation, that's given off by the Earth. This can be trapped by clouds. And by the way, note that clouds affect more than just these two components of the climate system, but this diagram is already complicated enough as it is. So first, albedo. What will happen to Earth's albedo? As we saw in an earlier example, Earth's albedo will increase because fluffy white clouds reflect incoming solar radiation. If you have more clouds, more insulation will be reflected away. How will increased albedo affect Earth's air temperature? It'll cool the Earth because it reflects more solar radiation. So the left side of this diagram portrays a negative feedback. Now let's look at the right side of the diagram. How will increased cloud coverage affect trapping of Earth's heat by the atmosphere? More clouds means more trapping of Earth's heat. You may already know this from experience. A cloudy night doesn't get as cold as a clear night thanks to the insulating effects of the water vapor molecules in the clouds. The additional heat obviously warms the air, so the right side of the diagram portrays a positive feedback. So the same phenomenon, increased cloud coverage, leads to both positive and negative feedbacks on air temperature. You can imagine that this complicates our studies of the climate system. And as I mentioned earlier, clouds have many more impacts on the climate system than just the two in this example. Well, we conclude this episode with a story and a sort of ungraded quiz. Imagine that only two types of animals live on an island, bobcats and rabbits. The rabbits eat plants. The bobcats eat only rabbits. For some reason, let's say the weather, the plants start to grow better than usual. This makes the rabbits very happy because they can spend less time searching for plants and more time curling up with their mates and making more rabbits. Before long, the island has a lot more rabbits hopping around. Well, the bobcats notice, of course, and they are happy. They can spend, spend less time hunting for rabbits and more time curling up with their mates and making more bobcats. Soon there are a lot more bobcats running around pouncing on rabbits. After a while, though, the bobcats have eaten so many rabbits, including all the slow ones, that many bobcats start to die of starvation. In fact, so many bobcats die that the rabbit population is able to recover. And soon, lots of rabbits are hopping around the island again. The remaining bobcats take advantage and start eating well again. Does the number of bobcats on the island result from a positive feedback loop, a negative feedback loop, or both? Pause me while you think about this. The answer is both. The sequence involves a positive feedback loop. When there are more bobcats, they make more bobcats. But the featured feedback loop is a negative one. More bobcats mean fewer rabbits, which mean more bobcats go hungry and starve, which reduces the number of bobcats. Now remember that positive and, need and negative feedback loops have nothing to do with quality or goodness or evil. A positive loop adds to the effect of initial change, and a negative loop works against it. And as we see here, and as we saw with clouds, they can act simultaneously or in sequence. And that's the end of episode 